So I'm going to talk a bit about the Henderson Diversified Income Trust. So this is a vehicle which we launched back in 2007. And what the trust is aiming to do is uh, it's aiming to provide a high level of income with an additional objective of capital growth over the longer term. <clears throat> we launched this to give shareholders a vehicle which uh, dynamically asset allocates between floating rate and fixed rate bonds. And what we do, we pay a quarterly dividend that we feel is sensible and sustainable. We don't want to surprise our shareholders in the trust. And the trust currently pays uh, a 6% uh, yield dividend. Uh, so if we go on to the following page. Uh, currently, uh, the trust is trading at a discount at the moment. Uh, when I looked this evening uh, ahead of the webinar, it's currently at a 4% discount at the moment. And if we go on to the following slide, uh, currently the trust has net assets of 150 million. We use both physical and synthetic gearing on the trust, as you can see in the table, above to enhance returns and deliver that high income to our shareholders. Uh, our belief is that we think that leveraging up high quality bonds and making a turn on being able to borrow at cheaper rates makes sense for the shareholders. So essentially this is a geared quality credit fund holding a mixture of floating rate and fixed rate bonds. What we do is uh, we dynamically asset allocate, which I'll show on the following slide, page five, uh, where we uh, we allocate between uh, loans, investment grade, high yield, and uh, list, uh, uh, equities. But that's basically a uh, is a bank bond that's been classified as equities, so it's really fixed income. But as you can see, uh, what we try and do is move between high yield, investment grade, uh, depending upon where we're on the cycle, and we also overlay that with loans as well. So what I was going to do was <clears throat> talk a little bit about where we are in the credit market. So if we go to slide seven, please. So, uh, so this is uh, what's been happening in the credit market. So if you see the right hand box, this is year to date returns to the 31st of May uh, this year. So performance year to date has been weak across all the fixed income market, like most financial markets uh, year to date. But what's interesting here is uh, the market's been selling off to, to uh, uh, concerns about rising inflation, geopolitical concerns, and which has now morphed into some growth concerns as well. Uh, but when you look at this chart, you can see that gilts have been uh, had a weak start to the year, so they're down 13%. Treasuries down 8.5% through to the end of May. And even uh, high yield uh, down 7.76% uh, year to date. But what's interesting is uh, yields are getting a bit more interesting. So currently on that chart, uh, US high yields yielding 7.5%. 3% and uh, US investment grades around 4.4%. And what I would say is that, you know, looking back at history, if we think the current environment is just a slowdown, then spreads are looking interesting. If we think they're going into a recession, then I, I think that spreads can go a little bit wider uh, still. If we go to the following slide. Uh, what I'm showing here are the default rates. Uh, they have been very modest a year to date uh, in 2021 uh, and 22. We've had two or fewer defaults per month for the whole year, both in 21 and 22. Uh, when I was looking at some J, uh, JP Morgan statistics, uh, currently the default rates in US high yield are running at 0.7% year to date and in US loans around about 1% year to date through to May. So that's incredibly low versus history. Uh, post the sell-off, uh, the default forecast for from uh, one of the big investment banks, they've, they've recently taken up. So it's 1.25% uh, is the forecast in 2022. So they are forecasting that will increase somewhat. 
and then they're taking the high yield default forecast in 23 up to 1.75 and for leverage loans they're taking up to 2.25 percent uh so you know that i think they're assuming that we're just seeing a slowdown i think if we're in you know, if we do see a recession, I think default rates will be closer to four to five percent uh, in 23. We'll go on to the following page uh, on slide nine. Uh, this chart is just showing the uh, distressed universe, uh, and the, this is a chart that's been produced by Credit Suisse. Uh, basically, what they're looking at is uh, they break down bonds according to price bands. And anything below 80 they think is uh, distressed. Anything between 80, uh, a cash price of 80 to 85 is uh, near distress, and then 85 to 90 is weak. But basically, what it's showing is that uh, due to the sell-off, you've seen a, an increase in, you know, sort of uh, stressed bonds. So that's a good predicator for uh, future defaults. We uh, go on to the following slide. Uh, on slide 10. Uh, what is interesting though when looking at the companies is uh, there were two learnings from uh, COVID I think. One was to build resilience into the supply chain and the other one I think a lot, a lot of companies took away was to build in resilience into the financials so the balance sheet how much debt they're carrying and that's illustrated in this chart here so you can see uh, on the top charts, you see the net leverage for the US investment grade and Euro investment grade market. The interest coverage is on the top right, but you, both of those are looking very good versus history. And that's uh, similarly true for uh, both uh, US and Euro high yield, which you see on the bottom charts. Uh, so that gives us, you know, some encouragement that some of the, you know, the companies will be able to, you know, if, if we are hitting a sticky patch, they aren't coming in with extreme leverage and they'll be able to manage through that. Uh, on the following slide, uh, slide 11, uh, this is a quite an interesting chart and it's an, a study that we did on the desk, uh, Janice Henderson. And what we're looking at is uh, we are looking at the returns from the different rating categories uh, within the credit market. So here we've looked at USI yield and US investment grade and what we've done is broken it down according to whether it's rated triple A, double A, single A, triple B and so forth. And we've got two charts, we've got one from 1991 and one from 2012 uh, and on the bottom part of the chart you can see uh, it shows the yield on offer, uh, the average yield through the period, the average return and then we also measuring volatility and what's interesting here is that we kind of looked at this chart and we've always been a quality high uh, quality credit manager who likes holding double B's, triple B's and uh, with a bit of single B's. And when you look at the uh, risk return ratio, so the higher they are, uh, the better the better that is for the rating category. This basically confirms that, you know, our premise that holding a lot of double B's in this fund is a uh, good source of return for us and that's what we have been doing. In terms of credit style, uh, I'll talk to that on page 12. We are, uh, we're quite unusual in the fixed income market. So a lot of fixed income managers will, <clears throat> they'll invest into a specific product area and they'll look at all the new issues. Uh, we tend to have a quite a quality focus when we're looking at companies. And so we've you, we use various screening criteria to screen out a lot of companies that are unsuitable for this fund. So we use sustain analytics, so ESG screening to remove some of the index. We don't invest in in countries which are not considered free under the Freedom House index. So that would rule out uh, countries such as Russia and China. So we don't invest in uh, corporates from those countries. We also uh, do something called sensible income. So what we try and do there is we exclude companies with low uh, free cash flow generation and uh, disappointing return on uh, on investments uh, out of, uh, so we screen those sectors out. And then we also don't do distressed in the in this fund. Uh, to, to do distressed well, you need to hold, you need to have a team of 20 to 25 people 
with uh, four or five lawyers working. But basically, when we screen down that, we uh, we consider 39% uh, of the global high yield index as uninvestable and 29% of the global IG market is uninvestable. If we go on to the following slide, that means that we come up with uh, these kind of quality companies that we hold in our, our portfolio. And what we've done here on this slide is we've just showing you uh, uh, some of the modern economy companies that we hold. Uh, modern economy to us are, are companies in the cable, software industry, towers, data centers. But when you look at this slide, you can see quite a few uh, recognized names. That adds up to about 21.5% of the portfolio. If we go to the next slide. We also invest in what we call the old reliables like banks, insurance, bonds, uh, food, bonds, beverage bonds, and uh, healthcare. And that adds up to 39%. So basically, through these two slides, you've, uh, you can see roughly 60% of the uh, of the portfolio. So what I thought I'd uh, cover next, and you know, this is quite a topical uh, uh, subject, is our macro views at the moment. So I'm just going to give you a few key highlights. So if we go to slide uh, 16, please. So what we do is we've we've got our own uh, in-house model. Uh, which uh, measures and maps the change of economic data. And uh, this model measures over 30 variables. And um, here we're looking at the US. And the goal line shows whether uh, the data is accelerating or decelerating and at what pace that acceleration or deceleration is. So it's the second derivative of growth. So coming into this year, we could see, uh, if you look at the orange line and then goes into the black line, we could see actually that the growth in the US was actually slowing down and the learnings from COVID. So you see the peak in the uh, in the orange line in in uh, June 21. Uh, that was basically due to three impacts of so stimulus, uh, uh, Biden and the Democrats won Georgia, the reopening trade and vaccines meant that you saw, uh, you know, sharp acceleration and economic momentum. Now that wasn't going to be repeated in 2022 and so we could see coming into the year that growth was actually uh, slowing down. So uh, uh, also what's quite interesting is that there's been a kind of divergence between uh, where we're seeing growth at the moment versus where the treasury yields are trading so that's the blue line there and it's opened up this kind of big gap and that's due to concerns about inflation which I'll address in a few slides but just that you know informed our uh, asset allocation so we tried to reduce uh, some high yield and uh, increase our investments into investment grade on the back of these findings. Go to the following slide uh, this growth slowdown uh, seems to uh, you know when we look back uh, versus history when you see these kind of year-on-year -year growth slowdowns are greater than 2%, they do tend to indicate that uh, uh, the, the economy is could fall into recession. And when we look back at the periods where it's been greater than 2%, that does tend to indicate that the US might be falling into uh, either you know sharp growth slowdown or recession. Uh, if we uh, move on to the following slide, uh, if we look at the you know the health of the consumer it's also painting a very bleak picture this is the uh, <clears throat> consumer confidence in a number of developed markets but you can see that they are basically crushing all of them so the eurozone japan us and the uk indicating that there's something going on people people are seeing a negative real wage growth inflation is hurting them in terms of uh, the expense expense of the, on the wallet and you know how much cash it takes out of the wallet. We'll go on to the following slide uh, on slide 19. So we have a number of people that we follow uh, and this is uh, a chart from a guy called Michael Kant Kantovich at Piper Sandler and he's one of the cycle people that we follow um, and basically what he's done here is he's looked at, uh, at the you know tailwinds or headwinds facing uh, the consumer uh, and w 
what you basically concluded is that you've got a high US dollar at the moment, high oil price, long-term rates are going up. So you've now, you know, mortgage rates in the US are over 6% on a 30-year basis. So in the US, it's, uh, they, when they take out mortgages, they take out a 30-year fixed. So that's a headwind. Uh, you've also seen increasing expenses from the gasoline and then the Fed have been talking hawkish, which feeds feeds through. All these things together are what we would consider growth tax. So this is a headwind facing the, uh, facing the consumer. So whilst some people will argue the consumer is very strong and it's got a lot of excess savings, we would argue that those excess savings are sitting with, uh, they tend to sit with the wealthier cohort and you know uh, the lower down income cohorts don't have those savings any longer and they're facing these types type of headwinds so when you've looked at uh, recently you've seen uh, profit uh, warnings from Walmart Target and that tends to indicate that you know the US consumer is, uh, is uh, struggling under the weight of this kind of inflation uh, what's the bond market saying well so we go to page uh, 20 uh, <clears throat> what we're seeing here is uh, this is the US 530s yield curve. So uh, what it shows is that when people are optimistic about the future, it tends to be quite high. So, you know, it's quite steep, if you like. And then when people are pessimistic about, uh, you know, growth going forward, it tends to flatten, indicating that uh, uh, the Fed will be coming in and cutting uh, the Fed fund rates at some stage. And what you can see here is that even f uh, all the way back to June FOMC in 2021, you started seeing this kind of flattening of the yield curve and the scale of the flattening so early in the cycle is quite a powerful statement from the bond market. So it's basically saying, you know, one thing we've learned from COVID is that everything's happened at you know, quite significant speed. So, you know, COVID happened in 2020. Uh, in uh, in March, April, and May, you were in technically a recession in the US, and then things things uh, you know, you know, 2020 was early cycle economic cycle in the US. 2021 was mid cycle, and 2022 is late cycle. So it has happened at quite a great speed. speed. But this is a powerful uh, message being sent by the bond market in terms of the amount of hikes that the Fed can do. We've uh, gone to the following slide. Uh, so what we've done here is uh, this is an inflation forecaster working at, uh, at the UBS. He used to work at the Fed. Uh, and the reason why I'm using his uh, work is that Alan Detmeister actually uh, called inflation very well in 2021 he was he was probably the first guy on the street to forecast that inflation was going to eight percent in early 2021 now what we saw uh, last week was that u.s cpi went higher than expected for may and it ended up at 8.6 percent but when you look at alan's uh, work what well, basically you've got the you've got core cpi so if you look on the left hand side Core CPI is the black line, and you can see that's already begun turning over. That happened in March. The blue, the light blue line on the left, that's the uh, uh, that's a headline CPI, and that includes measures such as food and energy. And they really got a uh, kick in from the Ukraine invasion. So you've seen those continue moving up. Uh, but, you know, inter and uh, on the right hand side of this chart, what you've got is the Fed's uh, preferred measure, which is uh, core PCE. And again, that seemed to be uh, rolling over in March. But what we are seeing at the moment from the Fed, uh, and they leaked a couple of nights ago uh, via one of their favorite journalists, that instead of doing a 50 bit uh, rate hike later on today, so they're going to issue a statement at 7 p.m. tonight. Uh, they're now looking at doing uh, 75 bips. And it seems that the Fed are intent on chasing headline CPI uh, instead of core CPI. CPI. And we, uh, you know, to be honest, we think that might be a bit of a mistake. Uh, and what you can see here is that core CPI, CPI I think, will uh, be kept uh, will be elevated in the next couple of months before turning over. 
So uh, we think, you know, uh, they'll get this June rate hike in and then they'll get the July rate hike and then they go on pause for a couple of months till the end of September. Uh, and they had the Jackson Hole in between. I think that will be quite an interesting period uh, where they might reevaluate re what they're going to do in terms of raising rates. We go on to slide uh, 23, uh, just, uh, just highlighting our ESG credentials here. So you remember the slide where I showed we were screening out a number of uh, industries and sectors out of the fund. That basically is uh, giving us a very good ESG score versus the global corporate and high yield index. So on a scope one or two measures, even with a scope three, we've got a very low emission score within the portfolio and also carbon intensity. Now, what I was going to do was just to conclude on page uh, 26. So we think the Fed will continue raising rates. Uh, the market is currently pricing in 11 and a half 25 bit rate hikes in 2022. I think the central banks now are getting terrified that inflation is getting out of control. But if you remember what I was showing in terms of growth, they're now hiking into a growth slowdown, which is quite a toxic mix. Uh, the chances of avoiding a hard landing are slim. Uh, the impact on lower income households is brutal as uh, demand is literally destroyed to con constrain inflation. I think uh, Europe and UK are pretty close to heading into recession already. The bulk of our portfolio is held in global companies, many based in the USA, which we think are much better placed for obvious reasons. And we think this kind of US global bias that we have and the quality bias that we have will help us navigate this uh, period. So with that, I thank you and I'll open up for questions. Thank you very much indeed. Um, you, most of the questions we've had, I think you've to some degree just covered in your in your final remarks there um questions around the geographic split of the uh, portfolio um and you outlook for the uk as you focused on, on on the fed in the us you know will we see the same in the uk um, and then following that kind of a big question there's a few parts to it um and actually i'll come back to that so if you wouldn't mind just to, just to, just kind of reconfirming the geographical split and then whether you know your, your personal thoughts on the outlook for the uk and how that impacts the portfolio yeah, so uh, uh, so I'm going to open up my, uh, my uh, portfolio screen. So that will take a few seconds. But uh, so I'll start with the UK question first. Uh, so I think uh, the UK is in quite a tricky spot. Uh, uh, you've seen sterling weaken against uh, the dollar. So we are actually importing inflation at the moment. Uh, and uh, I think... Uh, You've also seen, uh, uh, whilst employment's still holding up fairly well, it was, you know, suffered a supply shock back in 2016. Uh, and I think, uh, so I think, you know, basically where I think the UK is heading is, uh, you know, you're seeing uh, negative real income growth. Uh, you're seeing the high street struggling, passing through inflation to consumers. Uh, you're also seeing that the uh, Bank of England need to start, are going to continue raising rates and that feeds through immediately to the uh, UK consumer in terms of mortgage rates. People don't tend to fix mortgage rates for very long, for very long time. So I think uh, it's a nasty concoction here in the UK. Uh, so uh, I think that will, uh, that will basically mean I think the UK is heading into a recession. Uh, we've, uh, you know, in terms of what we do with the portfolio here, uh, we are, we've got a few exposures, but it's basically banks and insurance companies in the UK. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, post the GFC in 2008, 2009, uh, the, uh, the regulator uh, was very, uh, very strong on the banks in terms of uh, making sure that they uh, uh, recapitalized and de-risked. And I think that has meant that that trade has been a very good trade to be in. 
In terms of the exposure, uh, portfolio exposure, I'm just bringing up here. Uh, so uh, we've got 71.5% uh, US dollar assets in the fund, uh, roughly 12% uh, sterling, and then 15.3% euros. So that gives you a good, uh, you know, a breakdown in terms of mix of currencies that we hold. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, you mentioned potential, if there is a recession, kind of 2023, 4 or 5 percent default rate. Um, how do you position the portfolio for that? So what we've been doing uh, is we've been upgrading the quality of the portfolio, uh, and then we had that uh, we had a slide where we were moving uh, our gr a greater proportion of our funds into IG. So what we try and do is anything that causes us concerns, we move out. Uh, we st we still stay fully invested, but what we try and do is move up in quality. So we have a greater proportion of double B, triple B names. So we cover the dividend. Uh, we don't take default risk. Defaults tend to happen in the triple C rating category and some single B, but we move out of those and anything like that. So what we've been doing uh, over the past nine months, I would say, is good housekeeping, where we've been looking at all the credits, uh, you know, very, very closely. Anything we don't like, we sell, and then we replace with something which we think has got better defensive characteristics, if you like. And for one final question, Nicholas, um, how much is sure. currency risk an issue, and how is it managed? Oh, so there's no currency risk. Uh, we hedge uh, all our, uh, uh, our foreign assets on uh, on. Uh, so we hedge it on a rolling basis, uh, a third, a third, a third. So we what we do is we hedge a third one month, and then a third, you know, every month for three months forward, and we then we roll those. So uh, we don't take any currency risk in this fund. Lovely, Nicholas. Thank you very much indeed for presenting. Thank you for joining us. Yeah.